The Battle of Halladon Hill was fought during the Second War of Scottish Independence. Scottish forces under Sir Archibald Douglas were heavily defeated by the English forces of King Edward III of England on unfavourable terrain while trying to relieve Berwick upon Tweed. The disinherited, ever since the death of John Cummin at the hands of Robert Bruce and his supporters in 1306, the wars of Scottish independence had also been a civil war. The Treaty of Northampton in 1328 brought an end to over 30 years of intermittent warfare between England and Scotland, but it also left a large and discontented party of Scots and Anglo-Normans men with Balliol and Cummin associations, who had lost lands and property in Scotland. In 1332 under the leadership of Edward Balliol, son and heir of King John Balliol, and Henry Beaumont, 4th Earl of Buchan, these men invaded Scotland with the tacit support of Edward III, defeating the Bruce loyalists at the Battle of Duplin Moor. Building on this success Balliol was crowned King of Scotland, however, with very limited support in his new realm. He was ambushed at Annan a few months later by supporters of David II, led by Sir Archibald Douglas, the Earl of Moray and the steward. Balliol fled to England half-dressed. He appealed to King Edward for assistance, have already promised to cede to him all of the counties of southeast Scotland in return. Edward dropped all pretense of neutrality, recognised Balliol as King of Scotland and made ready for war. Berwick under siege. At the beginning of 1333 the atmosphere on the border was tense. England was openly preparing for war. In Scotland Archibald Douglas, brother of the good Sir James Douglas, and now guardian of the realm for the underage David, made arrangements for the defence of Berwick-upon-Tweed. Weapons and supplies were gathered, and the defence of the town was entrusted to Sir Alexander Seaton. These preparations were all complete by the time Balliol crossed into Roxburghshire on 10 March. Besides the disinherited lords he was also accompanied by a number of English magnates. The army advanced quickly towards Berwick, which was placed under siege. The deceptions of the previous year had gone. Balliol was acting quite openly in the English interest. The Second War of Independence was underway. Edward arrived at Berwick in person around 1 May, after leaving Queen Philippa in the safety of Bamburgh Castle on the Northumberland coast. His ally and protege had been at Berwick for some two months, and had been so far unmolested that he had been able to place the town under close siege. Trenches had been dug, the water supply cut and all communication with the hinterland ended. The Guardian's inactivity contrasts sharply with Robert Bruce's swift response to the siege of 1319. Douglas seems to have spent the time gathering a national army, rather than using the troops he already had in diversionary raids. With the arrival of the English king the attack on Berwick began in earnest. Seaton carried out a spirited defence, but by the end of June, under repeated attack by land and sea, his troops were close to exhaustion. He requested and was granted a short truce, but only on the condition that he surrender if not relieved by the 11th of July. As a guarantee of good faith Seaton was required to hand over a number of hostages, which included his son, Thomas. Scotland was now faced with exactly the same situation that England had before Bannockburn. As a matter of national pride Douglas would have to come to the relief of Berwick, just as Edward II had come to the relief of Stirling Castle in 1314. The army the Guardian had spent so much time gathering was now compelled to take to the field, with all initiative lost. Nevertheless, Douglas a force was an impressive representation of the nation's strength and unity, with volunteers coming from all corners of the realm. As with all medieval armies the precise number of troops is difficult to estimate. It is possible, though, that the army was at least as strong as that which had fought at Bannockburn, perhaps even stronger. Douglas now began his belated march to the border, advanced to Bambara. In an attempt to draw Edward away from Berwick, Douglas entered England on the 11th of July, the last day of Seton's truce. 
He advanced eastward to the little port of Tweedmouth, in contested Northumberland. Tweedmouth was destroyed in sight of the English army. Edward did not move. A small party of Scots led by Sir William Keith managed with some difficulty to make their way across the ruins of the old bridge to the northern bank of the Tweed. Keith and some of his men were able to force their way through to the town. Douglas chose to consider this as a technical relief and sent messages to Edward calling on him to depart. This was accompanied with the threat that if he failed to do so, the Scots army would continue south and devastate England. Again Edward did not move, so Douglas marched south to Bamburgh, perhaps hoping for a repeat of the events that led in former years to the Battle of Mighton. Whatever concerns the king had for his queen he knew that Bamburgh was strong and could easily withstand a siege. The Scots, moreover, did not have the time to construct the kind of equipment that would be necessary to take the fortress by assault. For Berwick, on the other hand, time was definitely running out. Prince returns. Edward refused to consider Keith's entry into Berwick as a relief in terms of the agreement of the 28th of June. As the truce had now expired, and the town had not surrendered, he ordered the hostages to be hanged before the walls, beginning with Thomas Seaton. A further two were to be hanged on each subsequent day for as long as the garrison refused to capitulate. Edward's determination had the desired effect. To save the lives of those who remained Seaton concluded a fresh truce, promising to surrender if not relieved by Tuesday 20 July. Everything now hinged on a Scots victory in battle. News of this was carried to the Guardian at Bambara. Having lost all freedom of action he returned north into the teeth of the wolf, Halladon Hill. Edward and his army took up position on Halladon Hill, a small rise of some 600 feet two miles to the northwest of Berwick, which gives an excellent view of the town and surrounding countryside. From this vantage point he was able to dominate all of the approaches to the beleaguered port. Any attempt by Douglas to bypass the hill and march directly on Berwick would have been quickly overwhelmed. Crossing the Tweed to the west of the English position, the Guardian reached the town of Duns on 19 July. On the following day he approached Halladon Hill from the northwest, ready to give battle on ground chosen by his enemy. It was a catastrophic decision. The Book of Plaskarden, a Scots chronicle, describes the scene. They marched towards the town with great to display, in order of battle, and recklessly. Stupidly and inadvisedly chose a battleground at Halladon Hill, where there was a marshy hollow between the two armies, and where a great downward slope, with some precipices, and then again a rise lay in front of the Scots, before they could reach the field where the English were posted. The approach was observed by Henry de Beaumont, who would have advised Edward of the tactics that brought victory at Dublin Moor when the two met at York the previous December. The order of battle now employed mirrored those used at Duplin, with some variations owing to superior strength. The army was divided into three divisions, comprising infantry, men-at-arms and knights, all made ready to fight on foot in a defensive position. The left was commanded by Balliol, the centre by Edward, and the right by the king's uncle Thomas of Brotherton, first Earl of Norfolk and Lord Marshal of England. Standing on the flanks of each division were six supporting wings of archers, armed with a decisive weapon, the English longbow. The bowmen projected slightly forward in a wedge formation to offer maximum use of supporting crossfire, an arrangement later adopted at CRE Acute CY. Edward was required to take no further action. For if Douglas refused to give battle, as caution and good sense demanded, Berwick would fall by default. Douglas' her army was also arranged in three divisions, drawn up in traditional Shiltron formation. The Guardian commanded the left, Robert Stuart, the future king, commanded the centre, and John Randolph, third Earl of Moray the right. As Plaskarden says, to engage the English they had to advance downhill, cross a large area of marshy ground, and then climb up the northern slope of Halladon Hill. Although the Scots spearmen had proved their worth against cavalry at Stirling Bridge and Bannockburn, 
The battles of Duplin Moor and Falkirk had shown how vulnerable they were to arrows. Not only was the ground bad, but it must have been obvious to the Guardian as he looked towards the massed ranks of Edward's archers that this was not going to be a cavalry battle. The prudent course of action would have been to withdraw and wait for a better opportunity to fight, but this would mean the automatic loss of Berwick. The Scots were now to fight one of the most disadvantageous battles in their history. Into the Sleet No sooner had the Scots entered the marsh at the foot of the hill than the first arrows began to descend. They continued to fall in great clouds as the Shiltrons freed themselves from the marshy ground and began the ascent up Halladon Hill. Having lost all momentum they moved slowly upwards, so tightly packed that even the most indifferent archer could scarcely fail to hit his target. The shooting was so intense that many turned their faces away as if walking into a storm of sleet. The Lanacos Chronicle reports. The Scots who marched in the front were so wounded in the face and blinded by the multitude of English arrows that they could not help themselves, and soon began to turn their faces away from the blows of the arrows and fall. Casualties were heavy, with some of the finest troops falling dead or wounded on the lower reaches of the hill. The survivors crawled upwards, through the arrows and onto the waiting spears. It was Murray's depleted Shiltron that first made contact with the enemy, closing on Balliol's division on the left. Stuart followed, advancing on King Edward in the centre. Douglas came in their wake. But even before Stuart and Douglas arrived Murray's front ranks were failing in their hand-to-hand -hand fighting with Balliol. With no let-up in the arrows, the Shiltron broke, retreating rapidly downhill. Panic spread from the centre to the left. With English arrows directed towards the flanks the Scots bunched in a disorganised mass towards the centre, much as they had done at Duplin Moor, as if each man was trying to hide from death behind the body of his comrade. Those in the rear began running back towards the marsh, away from the killing ground. Scots honour was saved by the Earl of Ross and his Highlanders, who fought to the death in a gallant rearguard action. With Ross gone the English knights took to horse, riding off in pursuit of the fugitives. Stuart and Moray managed to escape, but few others were as lucky. The battlefield was a grim place, the Guardian lay dead with five other earls. They died in the company of the nameless commons of Scotland, who fell in thousands. English casualties were light. The following day Berwick surrendered. Aftermath Immediately after the town's capitulation, Edward ordered Henry de Percy, 2nd Baron Percy to be the constable, with Sir Thomas Gray of Heaton, father of the chronicler Thomas Gray, as his deputy. Edward considering his part done, left for the south, and left Balliol to quell any remaining resistance in Scotland. Shock and celebration news of Halladon sent shock waves across southern Scotland. Edward soon received the fealty of several important landowners in the area. In England, the victory, the first for many years, brought a great boost to the morale of the nation. Bannockburn had finally been avenged. The English poet, Lawrence Minot, was exultant. A little throw that foresaid tune Halidorn Hill that s the name Tyre was cracked many a crown of wild Scots, and alls of tame, Tyre was Tyre banner born all doon. Other balladeers celebrated the restoration of English national pride. Scots out of Berwick and Aberdeen at the burn of Bannock ye were far too keen. King Edward has avenged it now, and fully too, I ween. Edward's victory at Halladon Hill was a more devastating blow to Scotland than his grandfather's at Dunbar. After Dunbar most of the nobles had been captured and lived to fight another day. After Halladon most of the country's natural leaders were dead, and the few who remained were in hiding. Scotland was prostrate. It was said at the time that the English victory had been so complete that it marked the final end of the Northern War. Yet a mere five years afterwards the chronicler Adam Murray Muth was to write, and so, men freely declare that the Scotch wars had been brought to their close, that nothing remained of the Scotch nation that was willing or able to defend or govern itself, yet they were wrong as the sequel showed. The time that had passed before Murimuth wrote these words had shown Halladon to be a barren victory.
for Edward did little to exploit his success and Scottish resistance, though Wick was never fully extinguished. Balliol proceeded north and held a parliament at Perth in October 1333, whereby he restored lands to the disinherited by reversing all territorial grants of the Bruce. In doing so he dispossessed a whole new generation of Scots nobility of their land, thus ensuring continued conflict. Notable casualties Sir Archibald Douglas, William IV, Lord of Douglas, Hugh, Earl of Ross, Maol Colium II, Earl of Lennox, Alexander de Bruce, Earl of Carrick, Kenneth de Moravia, 4th Earl of Sutherland, Alan Stewart of Dreghorn, John Campbell, Earl of Athlil, the Scottish Battle Order A number of related manuscripts and versions of the Brute Chronicle give the names of the leading knights of the Scottish Battle Order. The chronicle account of the battle was included in Hector Boese's Historia Gentis Scotorum with an abbreviated list of personnel. The fullest list, written in French, is kept in the library of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, with an estimation of numbers and casualties. The names and numbers from these chronicle sources may be inaccurate. The Vanguard, James Frizzle, Count of Morua, Walter Stewart, Raynaud Nee, Patrick de Graham, John Grant, James Cardroke, Patrick de Chartres, Robert de Caldercoats, Philip de Mildrum, James Dujardin, Thomas de Kirkpatrick, Gilbert Wiseman, Adam de Gordon, James de Gramoth, John Lagrange Younger, Robert de Gordon Younger, all barons with their followers, the Midgard, Earl of Menteith, Seneschal of Scotland, Sir James his uncle, William Douglas, David de Lindsay, Hugh Fleming, William de Keith, Duncan Campbell, James Stewart of Caldrew, Alan Stewart, William du Jardin, William de Rabinathy, William de Breen de Eldington, John Le Fitzwilliam, Adam Moore, Walter Fitzgilbert, John de Crichton, all barons with their followers, the Tears. Hugh, Earl of Ross, Earl of Strathern de Southern Land, William Kirkley, John de Cambron, Gilbert de La Haye, William Gordon, William Prendergast, David Marr, Guardian of the County of Marr, Christian de Hertz, John Thomas, all barons and their followers, Rearguard, Archibald Douglas, Guardian of Scotland, Earl of Lennox, Earl of Carrick, Earl of Fife, Counter Dassels do down. Earl of Athel of Dune, Robert Bruce, Robert de Lauder, the son of Sir William Viperwin, William de Lemmingston, John de Laundles, Jocelyn, Shiringlo, William Thraterly, Bernard Frizzle, John de Lindsay, Alexander de Lindsay, Alexander de Grey, Ingram de Rumfreville, Patrick de Polworth, David de Weems, Michelle Lescott, Richard Lauder, Thomas de Bois, Rogier de Mortimer, all barons with their followers. In Berwick, the Earl of the March Patrick, Keeper of Berwick Castle and 100 men-at-arms, Alexander Seaton, Elder, Keeper of the town with 100 men and many more from the countryside, totals, of Earls, 10, to Barons, 69, of Knights Bachelors, 105, of Men-at-arms, 4,250, of Ordinary Folk, 63, 200, in Berwick, Townsmen and Country Folk, 5,000, the sum total, 67,624, the estimation of the casualties, of nobles 4,000, of common people 19,000.